guests to please uh, take their seats. We can get started. The Committee on Energy and Commerce will now come to order. Um, before my opening statement, just as a reminder to our committee members on both sides, uh, it's another busy day at Energy and Commerce. In addition, as you will recall, to this morning's Facebook hearing, later today, um, our health subcommittee will hold its third in the series of legislative hearings on solutions to combat the opioid crisis. And remember, our oversight and investigation subcommittee will hold a hearing where we'll get an update on the restoration of Puerto Rico's electric infrastructure following last year's hurricane season. Um, so just a reminder, when this hearing concludes, I think we have votes on the House floor. Our intent is to get through every, every member before that point uh, to be able to ask questions. But then after the votes, we will come back into our subcommittees to do that work. As Ray Baum used to say, the fun never stops. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for purposes of an opening statement. Good morning and welcome, Mr. Zuckerberg, to the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House. We've called you here today for two reasons. One is to examine the alarming reports regarding breaches of trust between your company, one of the biggest and most powerful in the world, and its users. And the second reason is to widen our lens to larger questions about the fundamental relationship tech companies have with their users. The incident involving Cambridge Analytica and the compromised personal information of approximately 87 million American users, or mostly American users, is deeply disturbing to this committee. The American people are concerned about how Facebook protects and profits from its users' data. In short, does Facebook keep its end of the agreement with its users? How should we as policymakers evaluate and respond to these events? Does Congress need to clarify whether or not consumers own or have any real power over their online data? Have edge providers grown to the point that they need federal supervision? You and your co-founder started a company in your dorm room that's grown to be one of the biggest and most successful businesses in the entire world. Through innovation and quintessentially American entrepreneurial spirit, Facebook and the tech companies that have flourished in Silicon Valley join a legacy of great American companies who built our nation, drove our economy forward, and created jobs and opportunity. We did it all without having to ask permission from the federal government and with very little regulatory involvement. The company you created disrupted entire industries and has become an integral part of our daily lives. Your success story is an American success story, embodying our shared values of freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of enterprise. Facebook also provides jobs for thousands of Americans, including my own congressional district with data centers in Prineville. Many of our constituents feel a genuine sense of pride and gratitude for what you've created, and you're rightly considered one of the era's greatest entrepreneurs. This unparalleled achievement is why we look to you with a special sense of obligation and hope for deep introspection. While Facebook has certainly grown, I worry it may not have matured. I think it's time to ask whether Facebook may have moved too fast and broken too many things. There are critical unanswered questions surrounding Facebook's business model and the entire digital ecosystem regarding online privacy and consumer protection. What exactly is Facebook? A social platform? data company, an advertising company, a media company, a common carrier in the information age, all the above, or something else. Users trust Facebook with a great deal of information. Their name, hometown, email, phone number, photos, private messages, and much, much more. But in many instances, users are not purposefully providing Facebook with data. Facebook collects this information while users simply browse other websites, shop online, or use a third-party app. People are willing to share quite a bit about their lives online based on the belief they can easily navigate and control privacy settings and trust that their personal information is in good hands. If a company fails to keep its promises about how personal data are being used, that breach of trust must have consequences. Today we hope to shed light on Facebook's policies and practices surrounding third-party access to and use of user data. We also hope you can help clear up the considerable confusion that exists about how people's Facebook data are used outside of the platform. We hope you can help Congress, but more importantly, the American people, better understand how Facebook user information has been accessed by third parties, from Cambridge Analytica and CubeU to the Obama for America presidential campaign. And we ask that you share any suggestions you have for ways policymakers can help reassure our constituents 
that data they believe was only shared with friends or certain groups remains private to those circles. As policy makers, we want to be sure that consumers are adequately informed about how their online activities and information are used. These issues apply not just to Facebook, but equally to the other Internet-based companies that collect information about users online. So, Mr. Zuckerberg, your expertise in this field is without rival. So thank you for joining us today to help us learn more about these vital matters and to answer our questions. With that, I yield now to the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, my friend Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. Facebook has become integral to our lives. We don't just share pictures of our families. We use it to connect for school, to organize events, and to watch baseball games. Facebook has enabled everyday people to spur national political movements. Most of us in Congress use Facebook to reach our constituents in ways that were unimaginable 10 years ago, and this is certainly a good thing. But it also means that many of us can't give it up easily. Many businesses have their only web presence on Facebook. And for professions like journalism, people's jobs depend on posting on the site. And this ubiquity comes with a price. For all the good it brings, Facebook can be a weapon for those like Russia and Cambridge Analytica that seek to harm us and hack our democracy. Facebook made it too easy for a single person, in this instance Alexander Kogan, to get extensive personal information about 87 million people. He sold this data at Cambridge Analytical, who used it to try to sway the 2016 presidential election for the Trump campaign. And Facebook made itself a powerful tool for things like voter suppression, in part by opening its platform to app developers with little or no oversight. But it gets worse. The fact is no one knows how many people have access to the Cambridge Analytical data, and no one knows how many other Cambridge Analyticos are still out there. Shutting down access to data to third parties isn't enough, in my opinion. Facebook and many other companies are doing the same thing. They're using people's personal information to do highly targeted product and political advertising. And Facebook is just the latest in a never-ending string of companies that vacuum up our data but fail to keep it safe. And this incident demonstrates yet again that our laws are not working. Making matters worse, Republicans here in Congress continue to block or even repeal the few privacy protections we have. In this era of nonstop data breaches, last year, Republicans eliminated existing privacy and data security protections at the FCC. And their justification that those protections were not needed because the Federal Trade Commission has everything under control. Well, this latest disaster shows just how wrong the Republicans are. The FTC used every tool Republicans have been willing to give it, and those tools weren't enough. And that's why Facebook acted like so many other companies and reacted only when it got bad press. We all know the cycle by now. Our data is stolen. The company looks the other way. Eventually, reporters find out, publish a negative story, and the company apologizes. And Congress then holds a hearing, and then nothing happens. By not doing its job, this Republican-controlled Congress has become complicit in this nonstop cycle of privacy by press release. And the cycle must stop because the current system is broken. So I was happy to hear that Mr. Zuckerberg conceded that his industry needs to be regulated, and I agree. We need comprehensive privacy and data security legislation. We need baseline protections that stretch from Internet service providers to data brokers to app developers and to anyone else who makes a living off our data. We need to figure out how to make sure these companies act responsibly even before the press finds out. But while securing our privacy is necessary, it's not sufficient. We need to take steps immediately to secure our democracy. We can't let what happened in 2016 happen again. And to do that, we need to learn how Facebook was caught so flat-footed in 2016. How was it so blind to what the Russians and others were doing on its systems? Red flags were everywhere. Why didn't anyone see them? Or were they ignored? So today's hearing is a good start. But we also need to hold additional hearings where we hold accountable executives from other tech companies, internet service providers, data brokers, and anyone else that collects our information. Now, Congresswoman Schakowsky from Illinois and I introduced a bill last year that would require companies to implement baseline data security standards, and I plan to work with my colleagues to draft additional legislation. But I have to say, Mr. Chairman, it's time for this committee and this Congress to pass comprehensive legislation to prevent incidents like this in the future. My great fear is that we have this hearing today, 
There's a lot of press attention, and Mr. Zuckerberg, you know, appreciate your being here once again. But if all we do is have a hearing and then nothing happens, then that's not accomplishing anything. And, 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 and I, you know, I know I sound very critical of the Republicans and their leadership on, this, on these privacy issues, but I've just, seen it, I've just seen it over and over again that we have the hearings and nothing happens. So excuse me for being so pessimistic, Mr. Chairman, but uh, that's where I am. I yield back. I think I thank the gentleman for his opening comments. <laughs> that we now conclude with member opening statements. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to the committee rules, all members opening statements will be made part of the record. Today we have Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, Chairman and CEO of Facebook Incorporated here to testify before the full Energy and Commerce Committee. Mr. Zuckerberg will have the opportunity to give a five minute opening statement followed by a round of questioning from our members. So thank you for taking the time to be here, and you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the committee, we face a number of important issues around privacy, security, and democracy. And you will rightfully have some hard questions for me to answer. But before I talk about the steps we're taking to address them, I want to talk for a minute about how we got there. Facebook is an idealistic and optimistic company. For most of our existence, we focused on all the good that connecting people can bring. And as Facebook has grown, people everywhere have gotten a powerful new tool for staying connected to the people they care about most, for making their voices heard, and for building community and businesses. Just recently, we've seen the Me Too movement and the March for Our Lives organized at least part on Facebook. After Hurricane Harvey, people came together and raised more than $20 million for relief. And there are more than 70 million small businesses around the world that use our tools to grow and create jobs. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, foreign interference in elections, and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. It was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and at the end of the day, I'm responsible for what happens here. So now, we have to go through every part of our relationship with people to make sure that we're taking a broad enough view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just connect people. We have to make sure that those connections are positive. It's not enough to just give people a voice. We need to make sure that that voice isn't used to harm other people or spread misinformation. It's not enough to just give people control of their information. We need to make sure that the developers who they share it with protect their information too. Across the board, we have a responsibility to not just give people tools, but to make sure that those tools are used for good. It's gonna take some time to work through all the changes we need to make, but I'm committed to getting this right. And that includes the basic responsibility of protecting people's information, which we failed to do with Cambridge Analytica. So here are a few key things that we're doing to address this situation and make sure that this doesn't happen again. First, we're getting to the bottom of exactly what Cambridge Analytica did and telling everyone who may have been affected. What we know now is that Cambridge Analytica improperly obtained some information about millions of Facebook members by buying it from an app developer that people had shared it with. This information uh, was generally information that people share publicly on their profile pages like their name and profile picture and the list of pages that they follow. When we first contacted Cambridge Analytica, they told us that they had deleted the data. And then about a month ago, we heard a new report that suggested that this was not true. So now we're working with governments in the US, the UK, and around the world to do a full audit of what they've done and to make sure that they get rid of any data that they still have. Second, to make sure that no other app developers are out there misusing data, we're now investigating every single app that had access to a large amount of people's information on Facebook in the past. And if we find someone that improperly used data, we're gonna ban them from our platform and tell everyone affected. Third, to prevent this from ever happening again, we're making sure developers can't access as much information going forward. The good news here is that we made some big changes to our platform in 2014 that would prevent this specific instance with Cambridge Analytica from happening again today. But there's more to do and you can find more of the details of the other steps we're taking in the written statement I provided. 
My top priority has always been our social mission of connecting people, building community, and bringing the world closer together. Advertisers and developers will never take priority over that for as long as I'm running Facebook. I started Facebook when I was in college. We've come a long way since then. We now serve more than two billion people around the world, and every day, people use our services to stay connected with the people that matter to them most. I believe deeply in what we're doing. And I know that when we address these challenges, we'll look back and view helping people connect and giving more people a voice as a positive force in the world. I realize the issues we're talking about today aren't just issues for Facebook and our community. They're challenges for all of us as Americans. Thank you for having me here today, and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. I'll start out, uh, we'll go into the questioning phase. We'll go back and forth as we always do. Remember, it's uh, four minutes uh, today so we can get to everyone. Mr. Zuckerberg, you've described Facebook as a company that connects people and as a company that's idealistic and optimistic. I have a few questions about what other types of companies Facebook may be. Facebook has created its own video series starring Tom Brady that ran for six episodes and has over 50 million views. That's twice the number of the viewers that watched the Oscars last month. Also, Facebook's obtained exclusive broadcasting rights for 25 Major League Baseball games this season. Is Facebook a media company? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I consider us to be a technology company because the primary thing that we do is have engineers who write code and build products and services for other people. There are certainly other things that we do, too. Uh, we, we do uh, pay to help produce content. Uh, we build enterprise software, although I don't consider us an enterprise software company. Uh, we build planes to help connect people, and I don't consider ourselves to be an aerospace company. Um, but overall, when people ask us if we're a media company, what, what I hear is, is do we have a responsibility for the content that people share on Facebook? And I believe the answer to that question is yes. All right, let me ask the next one. You can send money to friends on Facebook Messenger using a debit card or a PayPal account to, quote, split meals, pay rent, and more, close quote. People can also send money via Venmo or their bank app. Is Facebook a financial institution? Mr. Chairman, I do not consider ourselves to be a financial institution, although you're right that we do provide tools for people to send money. So you've mentioned several times that you started Facebook in your dorm room. 2004, 15 years, 2 billion users, and several, unfortunately, breaches of trust later. Facebook's today, is Facebook today the same kind of company you started with a hartford.edu email address? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think we've evolved quite a bit as a company. Um, when I started it, I certainly didn't think that we would be the ones building this broad of a community around the world. I thought someone would do it. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be us. Uh, so we've definitely grown. And, and you've recently said that you and Facebook have not done a good job of explaining what Facebook does. And so back in 2012 and 2013, when a lot of this scraping of user and friend data was happening, did it ever cross your mind that you should be communicating more clearly with users about how Facebook is monetizing their data? I understand that Facebook does not sell user data, per se, in the traditional sense. It's also just as true that Facebook's user data is probably the most valuable thing about Facebook. In fact, it may be the only truly valuable thing about Facebook. Why wasn't explaining what Facebook does with users' data a higher priority uh, for you as a co-founder and, and now as CEO? Mr. Chairman, you're right that we don't sell any data. And I would say that we do try to explain what we do as, as time goes on. It's a, it's a broad system. You know, every day, about 100 billion times a day, people come to one of our products, whether it's Facebook or Messenger or Instagram or WhatsApp, to put in a piece of content, whether it's a, a photo that they want to share or a message they want to send someone. And every time, there's a control right there uh, about who you want to share it with. Do you want to share it publicly to broadcast it out to everyone? Do you want to share it with your friends, a specific group of people? Do you want to message it to just one, one person or a couple of people? That's the most important thing that we do, and I think that in the product that's quite clear. I do think that we can do a better job of explaining how advertising works. There is a common misperception, as you say, that is just reported, often keeps on being reported, that for some reason we sell data. 
I can't be clearer on this topic. We don't sell data. That's not how advertising works. Uh, and I do think we could probably be doing a clearer job explaining that given the misperceptions that are out there. Given the situation, are, can you manage the issues that are before you or does Congress need to intercede? I'm, I'm going to leave that because I'm, I'm over my time. That, and, and I want to flag an issue the Vietnam Veterans of America has, have raised, too, and we'll get back with your staff on that about some fake pages that are up. But I want to stay on schedule. So with that, I'll yield to uh, Mr. Pallone for four minutes. Uh, thank you. I, Mr. Zegarov, you talked about how positive and optimistic you are, and I'm, I guess I'm sorry because I'm not. I don't have much faith in corporate America, and I certainly don't have much faith in their... GOP allies here in Congress. Um, I really look at everything in ter that this committee does, or most of what this committee does, in terms of the right to know. In other words, they, I always fear that people, you know, they go on Facebook, they don't necessarily know what's happening or what's going on with their data. And so to the extent that we could pass legislation, which I think we need, and you said that we probably should have some legislation, I want that legislation to give people the right to know, to empower them, to, um, um, to uh, you know, provide more transparency, I guess, is the best way to put So I'm looking at everything through that sort of lens. So uh, just let me ask you three quick questions, and I'm going to ask it to, uh, answer yes or no because of the time. Yes, yes or no, is Facebook limiting the amount or type of data Facebook itself collects or uses? Congressman, yes, we limit a lot of the data that we collect and use. But see, I, I don't see that in the announcements you've made. Like, you've made all these announcements the last few days about the changes you're going to make, and I don't really see how that, how those announcements or changes limit the amount or type of data that Facebook collects or uses in an effective way. But let me go to the second one. Again, this is my concern that users currently may not know or take affirmative action to protect their own privacy. Yes or no, is Facebook changing any user default settings to be more privacy protective? Congressman, yes. In, in, in response to these issues, we've changed a lot of the way that our platform works so that way developers can't get access to as much information. But see, again, I don't see that in, in the changes you, that you propose. I don't really see any way that um, these user default settings you're changing these user default settings in a way that is going to be more privacy protection. But let me uh, protect it. But let me go to the third one. Yes or no, will you commit to changing all the user default settings to minimize to the greatest extent possible the collection and, user, and use of users' data? Can you make that commitment? Congressman, we try to collect and, and give people the ability but I'd like to you to data. answer yes or no, if you could. Will you make the commitment to change all the user, to changing all the user default settings to minimize to the greatest extent possible the collection and use of users' data. That's, I don't think that's hard for you to say yes to unless I'm missing something. Congressman, this is a complex issue that I think is, deserves more than a one-word answer. Well, again, that's disappointing to me because I think you should make that commitment and maybe what we could do is follow up with you on this if possible, if that's okay. If we can do that follow-up. Yes. All right. Now, you said yesterday that each of us uh, owns the content that we put on Facebook and that Facebook gives some control to consumers over their content, but we know about the problems with Cambridge Analytica. I know you changed your rules in 2014 and again this week, but you still allow third parties to have access to personal data. How can consumers have control over their data when Facebook doesn't have control over the data itself? That's my concern. Last question. Congressman. What we, allowed, what we allow with our developer platform is for people to choose to sign into other apps and bring their data with them. That's something that a lot of people want to be able to do. The reason why we built the developer platform in the first place was because we thought it would be great if more experiences that people had could be more social. So if you could um, have a calendar that showed your friends' birthdays, if you could have an address book that had pictures of your friends in it, um, if you could have a map that showed your friends' addresses on it, in order to do that, you need to be able to sign into an app, bring some of your data and some of your friends' data, and that's what we built. Now, since then, we've recognized that that can be used for abuse, too, so we've limited it, so now people can only bring their data when they go to an app. Uh, but that's something that a lot of people do on a day-to-day -day basis, is sign into apps, 
in websites with their with, with Facebook, and that's something that I we're, we're going to have to. Yeah, I know. I still think that question. there's not enough. People aren't empowered enough sure. to really make those decisions in a positive way. Chair now us. recognizes uh, former chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Barton of Texas, for four minutes. Well, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here. Um, people need to know that you're here voluntarily. You're not here because you've been subpoenaed, so we appreciate that. Um, sitting behind you have a gentleman used to be counsel for the committee, Mr. Jim Barnett, and if he's affiliated with Facebook, you've got a good one. If he's not, he's just got a great seat. I don't know, if, <laughs> know what it is. Um, I'm going to read you a question that I was asked. I got this through Facebook, and I've got dozens like this. So my first question, um, please ask Mr. Zuckerberg, why is Facebook censoring conservative bloggers such as Diamond and Silk? Facebook called them unsafe to the community. That is ludicrous. They hold conservative views. That isn't unsafe. What's your response to Congressman, in that specific case, our team made an enforcement error, uh, and we have already gotten in touch with them to reverse it. Well, Facebook does tremendous good. When, when I met you in my office eight years ago, you don't remember that, but I've got a picture of you when you had curly hair, and um, Facebook had 500 million users. Now it's got over 2 billion. That's a success story uh, in, in anybody's book. It's such an integral part of certainly young Americans' lives that you need to work with Congress and the community to ensure that it is a neutral, safe, and to the largest extent possible, private platform. Do you agree with that? Congressman, I do agree that we should work to give people the fullest free expression that is possible. That's what, when I talk about giving people a voice, that's what I care about. Okay. Um, let's talk about children. Children can get a Facebook account of their own, I believe, starting at age 13. Is that not correct? Congressman, that's correct. Okay. Is there any reason that we couldn't have just a no data sharing policy period until you're 18? Just if you're a a child with your own Facebook account until you reach the age of 18, you know, it's, it's you know, you can't share anything. It's, it's their data, their pictures. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. Nobody gets to scrape it. Nobody gets to access it. It's absolutely, totally private. Well, what's, for children, what's wrong with that? Congressman, we have a number of measures in place to protect minors specifically. We make it so that adults can't contact minors who they, they aren't already friends with. Uh, we make it so that certain content that may be inappropriate for minors we don't show. The reality that we see is that teens often do want to share their opinions publicly. And that's a service that... Uh, well, we would let them opt in to do that. Yes, we do. But don't, you know, unless they specifically allow it, then don't allow it. That's my point. Congressman, every time that someone chooses to share something on Facebook, you go to the app, right there, it says, who do you want to share with? When you sign up for a Facebook account, it starts off sharing with just your friends. If you want to share it publicly, you have to specifically go and change that setting to be sharing publicly. Well, I'm, every I'm, about, time, I'm about out of time. I, I actually use Facebook. Um, and, you know, I know if you take the time, you can go to your privacy and click on that, and you can go to your settings and click on that. Uh, you can pretty well set up your Facebook account to, to, to be almost totally private, but you have to really work at it. And my time's expired. Uh, hopefully we can do some questions in writing as a follow-up. Absolutely. You, Chairman. Chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for four minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.